Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Samantha Tai, and I am the Audience Relations and Communication Coordinator here at InterArts Matrix. Before we continue with today's program, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land from which I speak to you today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Neutral Peoples. The city now known as Kitchener exists under the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, which was originally signed by the Six Nations and the Dutch. But throughout history, other nations, including France and England, have also signed on. This treaty is made up of three tenets that characterize our collective responsibility. Take only what you need, leave enough for others, and keep the dish clean. As a settler on this land, I am also bound to this treaty, and I recognize that I have not always upheld my treaty duties. I share this with you because whether we are colonizers or have been colonized, we need to recognize the impact that colonization has had because we are all responsible in creating a more just future for everyone. So once again, welcome to this afternoon's X camera talk. For those of you who might be joining our community for the first time today, I just want to give a little background on how X camera got started and why we do what we do. So the X camera series began in the spring of 2019 when a group of people who were interested in the arts um, began gathering at Fresh Ground Cafe or the Common Studio in downtown Kitchener um, every Friday afternoon to hear a lecture by an interdisciplinary artist or professional. Um, following these lectures, there was a time for people to stay in the space, to get to know each other, to have lunch with each other, and to really build a community. This happened every Friday afternoon until March 2020 when our gatherings shifted online. And it's in this spirit of supporting artists and building community that X Camera continues virtually here on Zoom. So for the next few weeks, we'll be focusing um, on the practices and projects of each of the six artist mentees who are participating in the Cove Covox Incubator. Um, so this incubator is kind of made up of two different projects. The first is called Cove, and it's a project funded primarily by the Ontario Trillium Foundation with the goal of transmitting knowledge to the next generation of artistic directors. Covox is a project funded by Canada Council for the Arts Stra Digital Strategies Fund, that's a tongue twister, <laughs> and builds on Cove with the goal of experimenting, developing, and sharing knowledge about digital audience engagement with small and medium-sized arts organizations in the Waterloo region. So this series of X Camera Talks will be hosted by game designer and artist Marie LeBlanc Flanagan. Um, Marie works in the playful spaces between people and is especially passionate about building connections and creating community. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Marie. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, hi, Samantha. And I, I am in turn going to introduce someone. I am pleased to introduce Grace Scheel. Uh, American Canadian Grace Scheel is a contemporary harpist, composer, and improviser based in Toronto. Her music hones minimalist textures within noise landscapes, creating a sound that is pliable, fluid continuum that's as beautiful as it is unconventional. That's from the Canadian Music Centre. Uh, yeah, and I'm delighted to be talking to Grace here today about her new project and about her practice in general. So welcome, Grace. Thanks for having me, Marie. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time because I have so many questions about your project. <laughs> but before we jump into it, I want to hear a little bit for people who haven't met you yet about, about you, uh, your practice, where you're coming from. Sure, well, I'm, I'm definitely like, like um, I think a, a pretty typical like backstory for a new music um, instrumentalist. Definitely was classically trained, went to university, realized halfway that I love free improvisation and writing my own music. And specifically that I, I really enjoy working with electronics and electroacoustic and trying to get just different sounds from the harp that I wasn't used to at that point. Um, so fairly, like I said, like fairly typical background. Um, so it was at that point in university under Catherine Ladano um, at the improvisation ensemble that I really kind of um, jumped into the deep end of new music and 
I've also been like a very much like an emo kid growing up in the Midwest. So uh, there's also like just a love for um, rock music, for indie rock music and, you know, like Daft Punk and like electronica and dance music as well. It's trying to like, like marrying all of those things um, as well. Um, and I'm curious, tell me about your relationship to the internet. Uh, I feel like you have a relationship to the internet. Well, definitely. I feel like don't we all have a relationship to the internet like because of the pandemic? Um, I definitely like my my brother um, was a really big uh, like purveyor of internet culture as a child. Like he was like the cool person who was always like, oh, web comics and things like that. Um, so definitely like I feel like like because of his influence and then throughout the pandemic, I decided to live stream on Twitch. Um, so I feel like like I became an internet person because of the pandemic and have um, a, just a, like a much, much more like deep dive into what kind of what's going on. And like everybody, like you enjoy scrolling through Reddit and reading people's like relationship problems and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, and I have one more question before we leave your background around like this emo kid getting into the harp. Um, <laughs> I, I'd love to hear about this transition. Like what, yeah, tell, just tell me a little bit more about this. Well, I, I always laugh because I, I came to the harp accidentally. Like when I was eight, my mom was like, pick an instrument, you're starting lessons, you know, next week. And my, my brother played piano, my sister played violin, I had a friend who played the flute. And I, I was just like looking at them and like going to the recitals as like the youngest child. And thinking to myself of like, oh no, like you have to practice, you know? So my logic at that point in my life was like, let me pick an instrument no one I know plays so that if I suck at it, no one's gonna know and I can get away with never practicing. Um, so, and like joke was on me because like, I thought a harp was like lap size and I could climb trees with it. Cause that's what I was into at that point. I was like, maybe I can play for some squirrels or something, you know? Um, but lo and behold, my first harp was the same height as me. And, um, it just kind of, you know, it, it, over time, it just became, um, what I gravitated towards and definitely what I appreciated. And I actually took a break between high school and going to, going to Laurier where I did a degree in Switzerland where I was like, no more harp. I've done it for all these years. My parents have forced me into lessons and I'm going to rebel. And then I realized after, you know, after that like two year break that I'm like, no, it's, it's music and, and that's what I appreciate. And I can, I can be that person who is like emo music and, and still play this very like um, quote unquote, like classical or classically troped instrument. Mm -hmm. And did your parents, I mean, I'm just, I, I promise believe this, but were your, why were your parents so obsessed with everyone playing instruments? Did they play instruments? Uh, no, um, but they, they valued music education. They just thought it was a really, really good investment. Um, and I was homeschooled. So I also needed something to occupy my time outside of like theater and things like that. Yeah, makes, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm like, okay, so now I'm really excited because I want to hear about your project. We talked about it in the fall a little bit, uh, but for people who have not had the pleasure of hearing about it, can you tell me about uh, the project you're working on right now? Sure. Well, we've all seen like those like Snapchat stickers, Instagram stickers. Um, you know, you hear a harp in a, in a film score and it's, you know, taking you to heaven, a dream sequence, or like something like quirky, like Coraline, where it's like, you know, a little bit, not Manic Pixie Dream Girl, but like, just like offbeat or, you know, like Joanna Newsom, for instance, people often think of the harp in pop culture. Um, so Not Your Angel with Baby Harpist is, is kind of a, a live show that integrates like avatar design, um, projection, um, harp and electronics to kind of discuss this idea of, of like the femme trope surrounding the instrument. And it kind of was burst from an email I got sent a couple of years ago from someone who told me that my ripped jeans weren't respectful enough to my instrument and that the, the, the harp in my professional photos deserved more respect than like my white ripped t-shirt. Um, so 
it's it's and it's it's a funny thing to say out loud because it, it's it was so baffling to be on like on the receiving end of such a random you know email but um to me at least it really pointed to a common thread that I've talked you know like with other instrumentalists even where it's like sometimes you just get into these situations where these people think that you play a certain style of music or that you have to look a certain way in order to play a certain style of music and then they force that image expectation on you so not change maybe harpist was kind of birthed from that experience and from those conversations that ensued um integrating all of these other technical elements i mean it's really suffocating the way people force artists and anyone into these ideas of what they think things should be like it's first of all it's like violent in the first place and then second when it intersects with weird sexist stuff or classist tropes or racist stuff it's like just so much worse <laughs> definitely definitely well and like there's there's a fair bit there's a fair bit of like unwanted attention that like you can get i think i think you know being on a stage in front of an audience and people looking at you it's really easy for them to to think of you as an object for their, their own enjoyment in addition to the music as an object for their own enjoyment. So there's also like that, that weird, like weird space um, where you kind of get hit on or people assume these certain things about you um, just because they've, they've seen you play or they've seen you perform or like, oh my gosh, it's such a great gorgeous heart or whatever, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they feel like they know you. It's kind of like, I, I feel like the musician on the stage is a lot like the person making social media content now or being on the internet, being online, that you have these like weird parasocial relationships where people who are watching you think that they know things that they don't and feel entitled to a lot of things from you. Um, well, definitely. What I think too, like for, for me, at least with live streaming, it's like, it's a, it's a, it runs this kind of like, really weird informal line where you're like you're in my you're in my house you're in my home where we're talking one-on-one it's very friendly but we're still all internet strangers you know we don't actually know each other um and there's that like weird divide of, of people think that they deserve access to you in other ways just because they watch you in a certain format or that you're more accessible um and it's always interesting to me at least trying to navigate the that kind of like weird gray area yeah and you know over the holidays like in December I tuned in I just went on the internet and found you live streaming on Reddit <laughs> and I was like whoa hey that's Grace and uh I don't know if I'd even it was weird because like I don't ever tune into that like that was maybe the first or second time I've ever tuned into anything mm -hmm. um and then people were sometimes like most people are really cool really nice asking for things sometimes people were like giving you commands like trying to puppet you which i think is interesting with like what we're going to talk about soon about these like um avatars but like sometimes people would be like play this song do this do that it's like whoa hold hold up <laughs> grace is not a puppet yeah well and, like it's a it's a funny thing too because like on reddit like whenever i live stream on reddit it's always just like send me sheet music i'll play it um because for me it's just you know what I mean like I you practice so much to keep up your traps you try and say read or this or that and I'm just like I I'm enjoying this in my house by myself and why not live stream it if people don't mind like there being mistakes in the music but it's always interesting for me for people who are just kind of like I want to hear Rick rolling or you know like I want this or that or like you know, the expectation is like, they'll say something you have to re react immediately because the online format like dictates that, that relationship, that audience relationship differently than if it were in person, because you're, you're interacting with a chat, you don't see people's faces and people connect more with things that they feel are interactive. Like I've, I've seen certain Twitch streamers where you can redeem a certain amount of number of points and all of a sudden their face gets a filter and you as the audience person control that interaction mm -hmm. so it's also like a weird space of navigating but like how much control do I give my audience like what what things do I give them and like how much do I pay attention to people who are just like you know saying things in chat yeah yeah like almost it, it, in some ways 
harkens back to me to maybe how plays used to be when people used to like shout things. <laughs> I don't know, it, like it feels a bit, it feels a bit old fashioned. And then also like, like you're talking, it feels very, very new. Um, but yeah, that brings me to my next question, which is like, I am personally very interested in avatars. Uh, I've been playing around with puppeting, you know, like I've recorded myself using my phone and then controlled a, a dummy, like a model in Unity that moves in that way. I've like played around with making AR face filters and I'm really curious about this idea of the avatar. And I would love to hear kind of like technically first and then like later about the ideas, like tell me about the avatar that you've been working with. Sure. Um, you might have to repeat a few things just because I, 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 sp I spaced out with longer questions, unfortunately. Um, but to answer what I think you asked, I, I think firstly, like, like just, just to state, I love and appreciate avatars for the sense that you can interact with people in a more visceral sense, like with VR chat or with, with VR online. You can make connections with people without having to be yourself. And without having to share your name and you can like try on different characters it's almost like DD &D in a sense where it's like what aspect of my personality do i want to emphasize with this or like what something completely other than who i am could i be like with this you know i could be i could be really really like um short and petite and have like this gorgeous beard you know, I could have wings, I could be an ogre, I could be a beast, I could be, I could be anything. Um, and I think there's a lot of like freedom and, and almost the ridiculousness of that, but in, in, but in the aspect of like, you can choose exactly how you look and exactly how you present yourself to people, um, firstly. So I think that that was kind of what drew me to avatars and that, again, that sense of anonymity. But additionally, what I love about, um, an, an avatar for this show, especially in its discussion of like femme tropes and really tapping into influencer culture and, and being um, kind of inspired by Snapchat filters and Instagram filters and things like that, is that you can create this ideal female that's always perfectly made up, the hair is always great, um, looks fantastic, closings on point, um, and interacting with that as as a as an appearance goal or presented as an appearance goal um whereas in real life like we have to work at you know looking a certain way so i don't know if that answers your question or if i kind of went off to the side a little bit no that's good you should definitely long questions are hard uh, i'm just going to ask you more and more questions but um it made me do you know this song uh immaterial by sophie Ooh, um i'm not sure I'm gonna put this in the chat for anyone who's curious. Uh, it really, like it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful song. <laughs> it's kind of an amazing reference um, for this, for like being anything you want uh, on the internet. Um, and also like some things around gender and presentation. But yeah, I'm curious also about uh, your technical vision for this. Like what were you thinking originally? What have you explored? Uh, yeah, for the avatar. I think, I think like um, my, my friend who's doing my script editing, like I think says it best where we, we, we always talked about like dream big and figure out like, like the vision and then see what's realistic with the technology. So for, for me, when I was first approached by Rich to do this project with Kobe Kovacs, I, I knew immediately that this is the idea that I want to go with. This is kind of like the themes that I want to try. And this is, this is the experience that I want people to have and to have that really like interactive internet culture vibe to it. Um, in addition to there being a lot of interaction between this angel baby harpist character and then the performer themselves. Um, yes. <laughs> so there's an angel okay so there's an angel baby harpist character mm -hmm. they exist um projected beside you let's say maybe theoretically yeah. mm -hmm. and you sculpted or like you had the vision for how this character is sculpted like what they look like 
do they sound like you or do they sound like something totally different? I, I would say like, uh, if you're a fan of Grimes, the, the baby voice effect that she uses in some of her music where she just pitches the voice really high and um, very almost like, like anime character-esque in, it, in its pitching and its tone. Um, but the, the, the fun thing about like Angel, I mean, having this avatar that's separate from like the performer, like me as the performer, is that like, it can't be this, um, this cool girl that everyone like both wants to date or, you know, um, other things, um, <laughs> just as much as, just as much as it's also like this, just like perfect, like, like womanhood you know, vision of, of, um, I don't know. I, I want to, I want to like insert the male gaze, but I, I feel like it's, it's fair to say like inserting the, um, cultural expectations of beauty or, or what, what we think people want us to look like, I think is the best way to put it. What, what you think as a, as a child, like the messaging you get in terms of how you're supposed to appear. Like, like Disney princess, like this, I feel like is the messaging I got. Yeah, well, like Disney princess, and then it's just like influence, like Mothica or Yule, where it's just the like, um, almost like, um, I don't want to say like, like trauma porn, in a sense of just like, I, I, I have issues, but I'm also like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, you, you want me, even though like, I tell you, I'm not good for you, kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this char- this character exists. They have a voice. It's different than your voice. Mm-hmm. They have a look. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd love to see your inspiration board for this, by the way. Like, if you have, like, a bunch of... <laughs> um, and then you're going to be in conversation with them. Is this a musical conversation or is it a verbal conversation? So the dynamic between the avatar and the performer is very much, like, Angel Baby is my online troll. Mm-hmm. Like, they are they are the person judging me or saying I'm not good enough or kind of repeating out loud all of the things like we kind of tell ourselves especially I think as like teen teen girls and things like that um but they're definitely like the like you know if I'm live streaming it's the person in chat who's just like oh that wasn't that great or I really wish you played something else or "I, I don't like it when you make it sound like that so that's kind of the dynamic is, is she's almost the antagonist of the story in terms of it's this perfect idealization of, of um, a certain uh, type of woman who then forces that image expectation on the performer. And like what happens, you know, as a performer, what happens when you've got that kind of like, you know, I, I want to say like online troll or online harassment. Um, what happens when you kind of have that negative light on you all the time? What does that do to you and how do you interact with it or do you avoid it? And that dynamic is kind of what plays out during the show. Mm. Is it script? I mean, it must be script because like who is going to embody the baby harp angel baby if it's not you you know what I mean so like does it have to get scripted in advance Um, definitely so like how how it's working or how I how I tell people it's like it's like we're building cutscenes for a video game um you know between the pieces and then sometimes during the pieces um angel baby has these moments that are animated in advance and and put in put in unreal and and you know filmed as a cutscene and then added to the show in addition to like the pieces where like they're visibly interacting with the performer. So it's kind of like it shifts between like the avatar as like these cutscenes that are transitions. And then during the pieces, um, the avatar as like participatory and, and throwing, cause there is some generative music in it that is random uh, in terms of like the content that's given to the performer. I don't wanna give too much away but um, there are some, some stuff that are um, scripted and done in advance. And then there's some aspects that are like, like you know, if you, if you give like, like a 10, 10 possibilities for what could happen, maybe three would happen kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Yeah. Wow. 
I mean, it's a huge thing that you're you're going to share the screen with. <laughs> you're going to share the screen, the space with this monster, you know, that uh, yeah. is going to be bullying you. I don't know, possibly throwing things at you. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, wow. Uh, I feel like there's like a cultural wave in a way of artists, some artists that I know, creating personas to represent things. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't, I don't know if you feel like you're part of a wave or if this like creation of a persona or of a creature, like, does it feel healing? Like what? I just would love to hear a little bit more about that <laughs> impulse. The impulse. I know it's just like, oh, trauma must, must, uh, must deal with it. <laughs> but no, it's like, um, I remember like taking a psychology class, like on adolescent psychology. And it was talking specifically about, um, the the differences in media messaging and cultural messaging to um, like white white female teens versus African American female teens and um, differences in how people perceive themselves um, based on the messaging that they were given and how that affect, affected their self esteem. Um, so just as much as there's this aspect of like oh it's interesting it's like studies on this that um kind of like do a little bit of deep dive there's also at least for me that lived experience of um you know being a harpist being a classical harpist being a a, a, a woman a cisgender woman with long hair um who you know if you go somewhere people see you with the harp oh um, you know oh my gosh it's so beautiful or like you play such beautiful things and there's always a little bit of a pressure as a performer because it's such a I don't I don't want to say rare instrument but uh, atypical like you don't just like walk into a building and there's a harp there the same as there is a piano um so there's definitely is that that aspect of like because you know you often run into people who are like this is my first time hearing the harp you know like I've never heard a harp before I've never seen a person there's always like a little bit of like a, a pressure to be like, I want them to, them to have a good experience. And I know my music isn't everyone's good experience, but I do know everyone likes Debussy. So maybe I'll give them a snippet of that. Um, so yeah, I think I think for, for me, at least like this angel baby avatar was really this, this embodiment of that kind of like struggle I had, at least in university, kind of going between these two realms of like, I've been classically trained but I really want to do new, new music, but there's always a need for harpists to do like weddings or orchestra gigs or, or things like that. And trying to kind of like forge my own way in that. Um, and it's, it's always funny to me with the harp community, especially is um, you kind of almost have to find your 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 people or your your musical culture outside of it in order to kind of get a little bit uh, I don't want to say recognized but like um, seen as valid if that makes sense because the North American harp community is still very much uh, classically focused um, and that's not that's not a dig it's it's more just an observation of, of there's just been more space and more attention given to classical harpists within the communities that harpists create for themselves than there are um, other other instruments not other instruments but like other other musical forms and this this thing that you're mentioning is something that I've noticed happen in every scene in every place in a way like it's like you have to get known outside x city to be recognized you have to be get known as like canada to get recognized in a canadian sense you have it's like always like getting rec recognized externally is what gives you internal support yeah which is it's interesting to me because it, it's it's and that's why i appreciate like like locally at least like there's spaces like numis concerts for instance i always think for me like my emerging cure i won the emerging curator competition with them back in 2018 and i, I always think for me that was the funding and the platform that got me started on the journey that I'm on today. And without, without that like investment, financial investment from them back then, I wouldn't have the gear, I wouldn't have the energy, I wouldn't have had the time to, to build a show with them that I eventually was like, oh, this is what I wanna do. This experience is what I want to do. So I, I additionally think there's just such a need for um, supporting weird art and just mm -hmm. supporting 
uh, emerging ideas and giving people the space and the time to try something new um, and not just go for like the easy out of like, okay, people really like WC, so I should include that somewhere at some point. Yeah, or like snatching up, like somebody has to do the investment work in artists so that they can grow and stretch and create and explore. Um, yeah, I love that. Uh, I, I know Catherine Landano did a lot of work trying to support new emerging artists. I mean, I was on the board of Numis a while ago and I, I remember how hard she was pushing to try and do kind of like experimental things that supported emerging artists um, rather than just like, let's grab the established people and put them on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, speaking of which, I'm curious about your journey with this project because, I mean, you're working, you, it seems like you've like slowly been building layers of support, uh, like in the community and financially, and I'm curious <laughs> yeah. if you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, like, like I said, like I was approached with this idea by, by Rich, she's the artistic director with Open Ears um, Festival in Kitchener, and uh, I was approached with this idea of, hey, there's this mentorship thing that's happening um there's a really good budget and there's funding for for you to have a fee to do the development um we want to work with you etc are you interested and him and I ended up having a conversation where I I um I talked about this idea because for me like as soon as as soon as like there was that like little grain of like something could happen or like you know like do you want to build a show? I was like this, I want to do a show on this, this topic right here. So, um, and I think I've lost track of your original question, but. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but for, but for me, but for me, it was just like, I, I really can't, I cannot underline and like circle or highlight the 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 um, the importance of having the financial means to be full-time on my music is, is what has led me to be able to explore um, Ableton Live and Max with MSP and like building these image databases and building these layers of meaning in a way that I couldn't if I, if I had to be working um, part-time or elsewhere. So for me, it was really like an, an immediate recognition of just like the opportunity to do something of this size um, has always been in the back of my mind, but uh, up until this point, I just never had the funding or the investment or the mentorship really to kind of like get this off the ground. Because it really, it really ultimately with a project like this and a budget like this, it's a team effort, you know. I, I wouldn't be able to do this without, you know, Cam, the production manager being like, have you sent contracts or let me help you with contracts and things like that or with Rich checking in, or just all the different team members additionally. Because while, while all of the ideas have been mine and all of the focus for the design creations have been mine, um, it's the collaboration with the avatar designer, with the graphic designer, um, with all of these other people on the team where it's like, I, I, I know the vibe, but I like your work. So what can we create together on this topic? And I think it's been a really intriguing journey for me to kind of be able to uh, pay people for their time and 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 um, have that team of support to do something of this size in addition to like you know like my sister sewed my costume um so you know it's like it's a it's a group effort it's a it really is truly a group effort um wonderful uh, yeah, we kind of like had a question that emerged and then it was answered, I think. Do you want to name any of those names? Are there any names you want to name of people like that you feel like are helping you right now in your work? Or is that sure, yeah. Much? No, no. Steve Cross is doing the avatar at the integration. Um, so like the the going from like, here's the design to like, here's a cutscene. Um, Hannah is the avatar designer and they're from India, actually. So that's a remote collaboration. Uh, Daniel Tapper, he's Toronto based and he's doing kind of like the, the max patches and a lot of the image, um, like AI image things like fun video aspects. Um, my sister helped me do all of the costuming and things like that. Uh, Cause like, I, and I, I don't want to reveal like what the costume is, but like, I, I found this thing and I was like, I, I know what I wanted to look like. I needed to be feasible for costume for like for show purposes. And so that I can reach my arms outward and play my instrument. 
Um, so like just things needed to be edited. And I was like, I don't, I can't sew very well. Um, and like I said, Rich, uh, Richard Burroughs is uh, my mentor on this project with open ears and he's kind of been throughout the journey and Cameron Slips, our production manager. Um, yeah, so like that's, that's kind lot. of like the team. Oh, and Connery, Connery Ballantyne is doing the graphic design for things that I won't yet reveal. And absolutely, Sam Yerkery says hashtag Teed Cameroni. And it's it's true. I think like like if 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 all the mentees could get together, we would just we would just be like having little flags being like team team Cameroni. Um, because I think camera is just the 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 admin support and the the production managing support that I think we've all just been like really thankful for throughout this. Yeah, it's hard to imagine this project without uh, Cameron doing what he's been doing. Um, yeah, uh, okay, and I have a question about, so we've been talking in this project in like the Cove Covox incubator, one of the questions that people are exploring is digital audience engagement. Um, what is that? Everyone kind of knows what digital is. Everyone kind of knows what audiences are. Engagement, everyone kind of knows what it is, but we throw it all together and it's like, what is that? And part of your work has been exploring what is digital audience engagement? I mean, like that's the grant. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm curious, like, what have you learned? What do you think it is? I hear anything about digital audience engagement. Yeah, well, I think I think it's like, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes, especially in an online format to make the differentiation between, okay, what's marketing and what's engagement? And where is, where is the line? Um, because oftentimes people are engaging for marketing or people are marketing with the hopes that they're getting engaged with. Um, so you see artists say on TikTok doing certain things like um, maybe they'll have a question of like, oh, what should I write a song about? And then their publicist will go and being like about this very specific topic. And then they'll, they'll, they'll do a TikTok about it where they'll be like, oh, that's an interesting suggestion. And then they'll make the song. And what that does um, or seems to do, you know, I'm drawing conclusions here. What that seems to do is it makes people feel part of the artistic process. Cause they're like, oh, like someone answered a question on TikTok and now it's this song, you know without making that connection of like, that was a plant but people don't see it like that because it feels genuine because it's, it's, it's in a context that they themselves, I could have been that person to comment that. You know, that could have been me. That could have been anybody because we we all had the opportunity to engage with that content in a similar way. We just don't know what's planned. Um, so I definitely think like with a digital format, there's such a um, there's such a, a possibility for interaction and a possibility for people to create their own meanings to work based on their own experience. Um, like you, you take you, you take playing a video game versus watching a movie. A video game, you're the one controlling the character. There's a sense of interactivity, and because of that, you kind of feel like your choices are associated with the character's choices, and you know you end up getting a bit more invested and affected in their journey. Whereas a film, it's a bit more passive, and you're and you're watching things progress. And for me, I feel like like that analogy is is for me at least what encapsulates my perspective on digital engagement. Um, I really wanted to feel less of, you know, a film or less, less marketing, less like, here's a thing, you know, join in or whatnot. Um, and more like, uh, I'm a part of this, I'm a part of the community and my actions might affect you in a certain uh, amount. And I'm invested because of that sense of interacti interactivity or sense of investment. Um, just as much as you, as you see people trying to like, like picking and choosing what parts of their story to share in regards to these projects um, in order to kind of, again, build that rapport and build that sense of sense of relationship um, with, with, with a digital audience and, and with their TikTok audience and whatnot. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's two things I want to say. One is I, as someone who makes video games, I feel like there's a really interesting conversation around like films versus video games and like video games often make you feel like you are making meaningful choices. But as a designer, one place I really struggle with is that people, people can't make like 
the more meaningful choices you allow people to make, the less you have any control over the narrative or story or something. So like you're making a sandbox eventually, you know, you're making mm -hmm. a world where people can do anything. Yeah. Um, there's just something strange and interesting there. And the other thing I want to just point out for a second is like this marketing person saying, I have an idea for a song and how like 10 years ago, someone like me, I mean, I was pretty online. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, compared to who, but I felt very online. Um, and so I was like, oh yeah, that's a marketing shill. You know, that's a marketing shill. And the more, the more and more people get betrayed and get jaded in this way, the harder and harder it is to have people, like to invite people to engage and have them feel it. Like to have them believe it's real. Absolutely. Well, cause I feel like, I feel like, like, you know, like we've been marketed for, you know, like however long, you know, we've been alive, you know, like commercials on TV, you know, billboards, all this advertisement. And even, even see it online, like during the pandemic, I would say like, if you compared pre-pandemic Instagram versus like during, and I don't want to say post because I don't want to jinx anything. So I just say pre-pandemic versus now. Um, but you look at pre-pandemic versus now and, and you'll see celebrity accounts, they'll share memes, they'll share candidates, there won't be visible hashtags and any of their links and things like that. Same with influencers. Um, people follow meme accounts um, more regularly than other people. And you see this, this just cultural shift on, in the online atmosphere from a more you know, forward, forward sense of marketing presentation to the sense of like, Hey, I'm a fun person. We should hang out, you know? Yeah. Okay. So I want to open it up to everyone. Um, I'm going to open up, open it up. Let me open the chat too. If anyone wants to jump into the chat with questions or raise your hand to ask a question, you can do that now. Uh, and while we're waiting, Grace, I'm going to ask you about memes. Uh, I heard you had a meme a meeting today. Tell me about, tell me about memes. Memes, memes are memes are a glorious, glorious comedy form. Um, especially because it's like anybody can make them because they're like as a as like a culture, like low effort is celebrated. And and the fact that like I can just go on a meme generator and do something really quick and it's like funny, like it, it means that the the um the barrier to entrance into like that as like a, an art form or, you know, like visual comedy is very, very minimal. So anybody can do it and, and, you know, find the jokes that make them, you know, laugh on the inside a little bit. Um, so I, I appreciate that, that, that about memes. And I also think that um, it's easier to talk about things when you're joking about them than necessarily like, let's have a serious like conversation about feminine tropes. It's easier to make a meme being like, I think I made one where it was like a heart, but like a cherub baby, just like, like making this little face. And then uh, I just wrote when he doesn't give a plug. And you know what I mean? Like whether, whether or not anybody else finds that funny, I think that's funny. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I, I love memes for that sense of just like, you can make really, really dank memes that are really out there and, and still like connect with someone. Cause it's just, you know, it's like vines for instance. Um, you can just like, I don't know. It's, it feels like a very authentic digital form of communication as opposed to inauthentic. Also, I see Noelle is raising your hand. Also, hi, Noelle. Um, before before feel, we jump on Noel, I just for people who don't know, can you define memes for? for oh, define. Oh no, um, memes. Um, my my personal definition that I'm coming with right now um, would be that it's like an online image or like GIF, which is a short looping uh, clip um, where it's either like it could be a pop culture reference, it could be like SpongeBob, it could be it could be um, like those motivational posters that were really popular in the 2000s um, with like usually some sort of like commentary by the meme maker in text form that either gives context for the for the for the for the media that you're looking at or like presents like a little narrative. Um, like I, like a meme, a meme that I thought was kind of funny last night was, um, when your attention, like with like 88 attention be like, and it's just the eye of Sauron, you know, like looking like when I'm not paying attention 
And then, you know, just like the flaming eye of Sauron when it's just like when I'm focused on you, it's like, ah, oh. it, it can capture just like the emotion, I think a lot easier in a, in a digital format than any other. And I think that that's probably why it's, I don't know, again, that's why I like it, so. That's wonderful. Okay, so the quick, quick question from the chat first and then Noel was, uh, what are your top five emo bands? If you have top five. Top five emo bands. Well, like I, I would think like, okay, if we're talking like like 2010s emo, it would be obviously My Chemical Romance because Black Parade is great. Um, Fall Out Boy because there's a local connection. Um, Thrice, um, I would say, oh, Bud Light for Benjamin. And I think that's four. And then I think the fifth is, ooh, I don't know. It'd be like Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge. Yeah, but I, I definitely have a mixtape my friend gave me as a as a homeschooler. I had very like limited music taste for a while, but I definitely have a CD that my friend gave me that was just called the cool CD with like 22 tracks. And at the end of it, she was like, after listening to the CD, you will know the true meaning of music. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. So that's amazing. Yeah. Everyone but like for me, a friend like this. Oh, totally. To, well, for me growing up in the Midwest, it was like everyone's cousin was in a band or like Warp came through and everyone went to that or had a story from that. So it was just such a part of the, how I grew up and where I grew up. And, and at least for me, like really captured suburban angst in a way I think other music forms didn't. All right, Noel, we've, we've made you wait long enough. If you want to unmute yourself, you can uh, ask your question. Hi, Hi Grace. Uh, it's nice to hear about your work. So for everyone else who's here, I am I might be the only harpist here. I'm not sure. Um, but I can 100% affirm and confirm a lot of Grace's experiences about kind of issues of gender and being a classical harpist. Um, I have one question, one question, and hopefully it's not too long. So if if you lose track of it, then I can always repeat parts of it. Um, I was really interested in what you said earlier about kind of, you know, like streaming culture and the way people, you know, treat <clears throat> particularly harpists or like kind of people in these like feminized positions and, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of weird, the, the weird interaction of like feeling like you're being told to do something and that you're like a puppet um it made me think of this book that came out i think it was earlier this year or last year by emily ratajkowski called my body in which she talks about kind of like not really having um agency over how her body was used by either as a model or actress or just an influencer on on instagram so I was wondering, you know, like, do you have any thoughts on how avatars or like VR culture or, or I guess practices, like how that plays into, you know, the way we think about like the agency of our bodies as women mm -hmm. and um, particularly, you know, for her culture. I definitely like mildly got lost a little bit because you had me, you had me just like, you had me going in the train of thought of just like, yeah, like, like, well, those, those experiences of like, like, you know, as like, like you said, like classical harp experiences uh, and things like that. But if I remember, um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking about how uh, avatars might affect our agency around our bodies. Yeah, and I think kind of the, the the ways in which our bodies might not feel like ours in digital culture, um, and how it, do you? I guess you don't have to be a harpist, but you know, what's the role of you know d digital technology or like VR, especially? You know, we're heading in that direction, and maybe how we can use that um, in a conversation about feminism and mm -hmm. classical music or just music in general. Yeah. Well, I definitely think like the one thing I really like about about digital avatars and even like like back like when it was like, you know, Second City or like Habu Hotel or um, uh, World of Warcraft, for instance, it's like it is your ability. You could be any gender or no gender. You could be uh, you could present yourself in a way that you felt was was closer to how you truly felt about yourself. Um, 
and people interacted with you, not based on how you yourself as a player looked, but as the character that you made and presented for yourself. So I, I know a few people who have said that I was more able to be authentically me before I had the means to become who I felt who I was on the inside. Um, and I think that that is a really beautiful aspect of, of digital avatars, just as much as there still is a, a conversation um, around how like cisgender feminine bodies are drawn, are animated, are, are given options. Um, Cause there's, you know, like a running joke with like say World of Warcraft, it's like, okay, you could get an armor class for, for a guy gifted it in a quest and it's like a chess piece and this or that. If you get gifted it as a woman, it's like a metal bra, you know? So there's still that aspect of, of other people's image expectation kind of within that or the, the, the cultural expectation of how you should present if you identify as, as female. Um, even within these games and within these digital communities, it's still like my options are limited. Like maybe I wanted that chess piece. Like maybe I wanted to have that option. Maybe I don't want to wear a metal bikini or maybe I would like a female character that isn't animated as thin or isn't animated as um, tall or, or all of these other aspects. And I definitely think like, you know, like, I'm talking about issues that were more prevalent, you know, a decade ago in these digital communities. There's, there's a lot, nowadays, there's a lot more of a, a um, more, more image and appearance option choices than there were. Um, but it's still like an aspect, I think, of, of, again, like my lived experience growing up in that culture that still, um, I think, resonates to a certain extent. So I don't know if I answered your question or if I went on a big ramble, but hopefully that's that's uh, satisfactory. No, that was really great. I, I really like this idea of persona being a, a new tool rather than, you know, like these narratives of authenticity that like, oh, you have to accept me for who I am, but actually it can end up making us really vulnerable to, um, you know, internet strangers, right? So you know like the avatar is this persona um yeah i'm yeah that answered my question so <laughs> well totally well and like and like as a side note like a recent uh like within the past few years a recent trend on twitch for instance is vtubing which is where you're providing a voice but it's a it's a digital avatar that people are engaging with and I think that 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 to me, like like seeing those communities, it's super interesting because people get invested in this character with this voice that you animated. Um, and again, like it, it can be a different representation of, you know, who you'd like to be or an aspect of your personality or something completely unrelated. But just the fact that like people still engage with it and people are still interested in it and that you don't have to be presenting your face in order to build an audience, I think is a really interesting aspect of VTubing um, that I've appreciated coming out on Twitch recently. Thanks, I will leave space for other questions now. <laughs> yeah, anyone with questions? I mean, this is a fascinating, I feel like we could go very interesting places talking about this, about VTubing and presenting. Like for me, uh, the internet was somewhat liberating, but ultimately not that liberating because for me, the prison is my body. Like for me, the Panepticon is inside. Uh, for me, it's <laughs> like, I'm, I need to, it, I think there's room for it to be a tool, but for me, it's like just suddenly having people not be able to see me isn't enough, especially since I know what I know about the internet. Like since mm -hmm. I know that there is no invisible anything, you know, that it's like everything is tracked and logged and it's just, yeah, it's an interesting space. And I feel like I'm also curious about Grace, your thoughts on, so there's like this idea of puppeting something, you know, mm -hmm. um, like VTubers do. And then there's like a step further maybe, which I feel like is almost, or maybe the direction you're going, which is um, when the person isn't even real. You know, like there is no puppeteer. There are a bunch of engineers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, engineer. it's like, well, it's like for me, it's like Angel Baby. Angel Baby isn't me as this avatar. Angel Baby is Angel Baby. 
you know, with like a separate voice and a separate character and a separate et cetera. So it's, it, it's interesting because I, I know, for instance, there was a, an AI influencer on TikTok that got, I think that went viral a couple of years ago, where it was just like, could, could an influencer be like an AI? Could it be, you know, like a VTuber-esque thing? Could it be this, this other aspect? Um, and I, I think for me, like, it's, it's interesting how you can build your characters, like world build and, and build, build this like other person um, and animate them and see like, will people interact with this? Like it's a real person. Um, will people interact with this object as if it's a living thing? And, and what, what, the, what that interaction it will, it will look like. And I don't have the answers because I think that part of the project hasn't like been birthed yet. But it is a point of curiosity for me of just the like, um, how are people going to react to this? How are people going to get engaged with this? And will they see it as a person or will they see it as an art object? I don't know, you know? Yeah, I'm very curious to see that, to see how people engage with that and how they engage with, with that relationship between you and this character you've created. Like, do they... Yeah, I'm very curious. Okay, I'm curious about something else. Tell me about brutalist web design. Oh, brutalist web design. Um, well, I feel like like the the best example of brutalist web design comes from the '90s and early internet culture, where people were just like, "Here, here is my page about aquariums, and it's just all of these fish, and you could you know keep scrolling." But it was like it was like the wild west. I want to say of 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 options because there wasn't like a because there wasn't because there wasn't a like a, a narrative or or kind of like an expectation around like well, what is good web design because web design was didn't even exist then it, it it's like the space jam movies web page you know where it's just like people are just trying things people are people are expressing themselves in like a way that they feel like it and uh, people are going wild on you know image and gifs and things like that um so i think what i appreciate about that and just like the long pages of text was was the sense of like you're almost like getting overloaded by information um and this is back when like you know and and i'm more relying on other people's experiences here because like i was i was a kid of the 90s i was on the internet but i was playing neopets i wasn't like on people's personal web pages um but what I appreciated about it is just like, like people treated it as such like an information source where I feel like web design nowadays is like how, how little information can I give people? How can I you know, make it more of a snippet without, you know, like overloading people? Um, so a trend that I've recently become really interested in is almost like this like neo-brutalism where it's, it's back to this focus on how much content can we put on this? Can we make it a vibe? Um, all of these, you know, like website design templates are very minimal and very like, so how, how can you create a web page experience that feels like you're immersed again or in this, in this idea? And what I'm excited with the website to explore, um, with this project, especially is, is, um, how do people feel going on a brutalist website? And, and can we explore what being overloaded looks like or feels like? And like the, the, the psychology of that in a sense. Mm. Yeah, I mean, these websites you're talking about, it's like, it's definitely visual overload. There's like gifts blanking everywhere. There's things moving everywhere, like these websites of the nineties. And then there's also this thing around like, I think amateur is interesting. Like people not having the answers is interesting. And when something like gets solidified and turns into LinkedIn, basically everything gets boring and flat. And like, I've had this battle where my artist website is very boring because I need it to be boring because that's the only way I get funding basically. <laughs> like it has to be like my professional presence but also it's supposed to be my art. And it's like not clear. There's this beautiful article I'm gonna paste in the chat. Mm. Called, my website is uh, shifting house next to a river of knowledge. What could yours be? around like websites being something like what are what are they anyway i'm super excited to to see your uh your site that hopefully eventually you're going to make um and i'm very curious to see this show 
Does anyone have any last questions in the chat before we close up? I have to laugh, Rich said, walking a thin line between innovative and GeoCity site. <laughs> I think that that's a really fair point. Um, thank you so much, Grace. I love talking to you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, so uh, thank you. And everyone, uh, let me like bring Samantha. Samantha, if you want to come back and I'll hand you back the microphone. Thank you, Grace. I, I loved it. Thanks so much, Marie. Yeah, thank you both. Um, yeah, so that's our talk for today. Um, there isn't an X camera talk next Friday, but we will be meeting again on April 22nd. Um, and Andrew Jacob Reinhardt will be um, sharing about his project above the line. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Grace, um, for sharing your project with us. I'm so, I didn't know very much about your project going into this talk, and I'm so excited to see um, the workshop performance. And Marie, thank you again for doing such an incredible job hosting. I just noticed so, there was an unanswered question, which will haunt me. It will, can, oh. we, can we, Grace? It was, it oh, was yeah, no, let's go, let's I didn't go. I know that was a thing. Okay, with Avatar, well, you should read it too. But with Avatars, I can relate to making the Avatar connect with who I am on the inside, like Animal Crossing. Part of it feels like I'm connecting with who I was when I was a child. Do you relate to that at all? Ooh, well, cause like, I definitely think for, for me, like, like I've said earlier for me, like this, this project and this avatar is really coming out of that lived experience. Like both like, yes, as an instrumentalist and yes, like within classical, classical music, but also as like a teen girl who was told you have to look like this in order to be valued by society and and um, people who look like that getting affirmed by other people within my community so like that 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 kind of like that subtle messaging of, of the you are not okay the way you are you have to change or accentuate certain aspects to make yourself more attractive to the people around you um so i feel like and i've lost complete track of the question but I feel like the lovely thing about um, this digital avatar and this this digital presence is is definitely like like a little a little bit of that dealing with that narrative that I was given as a child and and given as as a, as a young adult and um, exploring it in a way that obviously like now as an adult feels safe and feels like you have enough retrospect to be like oh that's interesting um, but but definitely like at least for me, like I can definitely see the connection between like things of childhood that you couldn't explore at that time that I can now explore both having the tech and the um, post site, I wanna say to kind of unpack and, and um, I, I don't wanna say process, but like investigate and dig and kind of sift through. Thank you. Okay, the real end, the real end is now. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for coming, everybody. Um, yeah, and we will see you on April 22nd. Bye.